Hi guys, welcome to Friday Hacks 201. And for today, we have one speaker and Chunke will be talking about Elm. So Chunke started the Singapore Ruby Brigade with a few others um, way back then. Worked at SlideShare to learn about um, to learn Silicon Valley, believes strongly in and contributes to open source. He's interested in improving about how things are done. He likes TDD and even gave a talk about the EgoBucon. For the past eight years, he's been running a high traffic, low maintenance, profitable access that pays for kids' milk and preschool, also doubles as production playground for trying new technologies. He's not a head of engineering and hopnote.ai. That's welcome. Hi, good evening. Okay, today's talk is um, why bet the startup on Elm for both front and back end. A little bit about myself. Uh, First, whatever advice you get online, you should always know who is talking. Then you can at least map your experience or situation with the person. So um, start off with basic, learn very imperative languages, normal stuff like C, Pro, Java. Spend a lot of time in JavaScript, Ruby on Rails, and then um, Go and Elm in the past few years. So it can be summarized into two parts where initially you'll be like, ah, how do I do, how do, I do anything? And you'll be interested to uh, try gems, write, write libraries, and solve problems. But in the, <laughs> in the, in the later part, right, it's mostly how, how do I not do anything, actually. Not because I'm lazy, but because uh, there are too many bad things uh, that can happen. So like, can I do it in a safe way, I guess? And this, is, this has to do with software engineering and programming, right? Uh, Finally, I learned that a bit later. So software engineering is really tiring, right? You need to be constantly vigilant. Why? Because you have to keep, keep that code base in a right place. Um, it needs to be, hey, please don't do this pattern. Hey, please don't do this hack. Okay, let's do this. So you have to shepherd a lot of uh, sheep and cats to, to, do, uh, to keep your code base nice and free of that. And then, yeah, sure, you learn about uh, design patterns and best practices, right? And you, you try to do all these things, like keep your code base nice, and then like, ah, this, this is how I do it, this is how I software. And, and then you, you try to keep on top of the game. But software engineering is, this code is quite enlightening, right? Software engineering is what, what happens to programming, something that you do for fun and learning, when you add time and other programmers. Time meaning that you versus your old self, like you do not understand what your old code was about and other programmers, right? Like um, maybe, you are, maybe you are the best person in the team and you're trying to uh, judge other people's pull requests or maybe you are the worst person and then you don't understand what other people is writing about. And in this situation, then you realize that actually all these best practices slowly become just a soft social contract because they give way very easily to urgent fixes, other people's requests, or you're just too tired, and then you, you patch here, patch there, and then there's no more boundary already. The compiler says it's, it's all right. So you can try your best to use all sorts of libraries to support yourself, to keep this uh, state of your programming, of your software to be in a good state. But it is, like I said, uphill task, and I call it uh, filled with food guns. So Elm has very, <laughs> very, very small set of uh, features. It's a, it's a super small language, if you know it. It may look strange in the beginning, but then it has some choice selection for uh, being to be implemented. As such, then it is actually, I will call it a life without food gun, right? Where you can't really do too much, which sounds like a bad thing, but it also means that you're always more or less uh, cradle in, in, in this place where you actually want to be. Sure, you do some shortcut, but you easily roll back to, to this place. And so you don't have to spend too much effort to garden your, your arm code. So, you, so being pure language, it also means that there's no freedom. In order for it to not go anywhere, this is very free. It means there's certain limitation to to what you can do is not conventional, like you 
Okay, so there are, there's this area of your code. This is your, the pure side, and then there's a runtime. So in your side of the code, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. There's a lot of things you cannot do. And you may be um, uh, not used to it and feel like constrained. And then the runtime is actually protected area. You, you don't really do much there. So in other words, you cannot anyhow, right? So, and it, all these things leads to that. It is a very maintainable code base, which, uh, yeah, I'll show you a little bit later. Hopefully you can experience it with me. But maintainability is, is, is not a sexy word. It seems like something um, done by the team B. Whereas then what does the team A do? Team A actually like ship features. But if you have worked with actual team A, right, you know that it, they are, what they are busy creating is features and deck. And it's very hard to move out of the deck if it is not properly done. Of course, it's not properly done because you know why it's always not properly done? Because the what you're trying to do is always changing. That's why that's why it's a startup. If it's defined, like if you are trying to code a web server, so there's no change. You can, you can do it in whatever you want. The specification is there, you have to work with all the browsers. But if you're trying to do a, a startup, you're probably are trying to solve a problem. And then somebody says that, uh, you know, this thing is not, not for me. Okay, maybe I sell you fish instead, or maybe I sell you horse instead. Maybe I don't sell you, maybe I rent you a horse instead. So you have to keep changing. And this all this changing, right, means that maintainability is actually the main thing that you spend your time doing most of the time. So let me flip the question. Instead of saying, oh, why choose Elm? How about we take some popular choice and then I ask like you to actually pick it. Why not? When I want to do a startup, maybe I say, I want duck typing. Like that. Just give a duck, to a duck name, and then you say, make duck. And whenever you see something like that, then the third line you'll be like, actually, who will do that? Come on, don't be rubbish. Who will do that? <laughs> the thing is, there's always change in code. So when, when code changes, you actually don't know anymore. Actually, in this line, you look at it like that. But maybe next time, this is the correct one, that is the wrong one. All right? So over here, it says, with that typing, you can ditch your interfaces and just rely on runtime. It sounds like a good thing. Actually, it's horrible. All right? Because if it's not horrible, then you wouldn't see this. There's so much runtime error. Why, do, why did the runtime error come from? Because people do this exactly, right? So this duck type. And yeah, when you add other people in and you step on each other's toes or some requirement has changed and you're not following this part of the feature, you're just working on the other part. You are not, you're not following and then this, this mismatch will happen. So dynamic type sounds so good. Duck typing dynamic type sounds like a positive thing. But actually what the fact is that if the code don't change, the type, there is a type in this code, but it's just not set. The type is that the user needs to be a particular keys, right? It's just, it's just not mentioned. You do have to pass the code top to bottom until the very last part. And then you will know uh, what type is user. Duck typing lets me if this is a choice, I choose duck typing because I want to know the problem later. That's why you choose duck typing. Why? I, I, don't want, I don't want to know seconds after I made the mistake. I want to know hours I've made the mistake. That's why you choose duck typing. So are you saying that, you know, let's get type vomit and then like do this all the way? No, 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 no. This is something I missed myself uh, while doing like Java and Go. And, so there's this thing called type inference, which is quite sad that it's not more, com more common. So this piece of code looks roughly, sorry about the color, looks roughly um, like the dynamic code, but each line is actually inferred with a type. And if you use it wrongly, if you use a greeting function wrongly, within uh, this Elm, 0 0.076 seconds, it is able to infer the type and tell you that, hey dude, you're using it wrongly. I don't know what type it is, the A and I, I don't know what exactly is the type, but I know for sure it needs a first name, which is the optional string, a language, a last name, a salutation, just by looking at this. 
And so it's able to tell you right there that you have used it wrong or your most, most likely not you, but your teammate has used it wrong, right? Causing the problem. So it's over there and not here when people tweet about your crashing stuff. So honestly, between these two, <laughs> duct type, type inference, same, same, right? Where the error happened, and this will tell you where the error happened. Oh, user last name is nil, crash. But over here will be some other place calling greeting. Hey, you, you are using this function wrong. You called it wrongly. This is the correct place to say where the mistake is. So is there even a question like, what do I want to choose? Of course, I choose live, right? And which reminds me of this, this chart. You see this chart all the time. Like we have like we have this spectrum and then do this graph. Um, I used to be and I fine with it, and then I learned about Elm and like, hey, this chart is way, this chart is way, uh, I don't know, understatement because there are certain types. It's, it's just an insult to put Haskell right next to a Java, right? It's different ball game, right? Different ball game. So you more the chart will actually look more like that, right? What's the things you can do with the type? It's just different. Which might, which might, reminds me of uh, a talk that uh, Linus gave about Git way back then about uh, in Google, comparing SVN and Git. And he mentioned this thing that still rings true. He said, SVN, it lets you create branches easily, but that's not the point. The merge is very hard, very, very slow. And, that, and that's very true. Most companies at the time will be, you have a senior guy and this person will be doing merging. <laughs> Whereas Git, it lets you merge easily. And the merge is so fast. This is the key point. It merges so fast, it changes the way you work. It's not like you do something, it's fast, okay, better, but now you're working differently. You're creating a lot of branches. The way you approach problem is different. Same thing goes for this type. Type, 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 yeah. On this side, you actually use types differently. Another one. Why not choose? Craft. Why not choose to have crafty code, right? If your friend or your teammate give you this code, you'll be like, what are you doing? But this happens all the time. You have a class, you have an object, you, this thing needs a lot of things you need. Maybe a database connection, need this, need that. And then you call something with one argument. Like, why is this so messy? Well, initially it is very clean. You have just the what you need, you call what you need, and then you call your data. But Objects and classes are a magnet for methods. You know, you have that A thing there, I, and I need it plus a B. Let me just bump and add that together. And after a while, right, I don't even know what validate needs anymore. Okay, maybe C and D are not, not useful. So you have all these, they just make, uh, collect together. It's very, very hard to tear apart. So why would I want, oh, no, 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 sorry. Let me re <laughs> reverse the question. I want to do my startup in an OOP language so that I can clutter up the code. That's very hard to tear apart. That's why I want to choose it, right? So Joe Armstrong had this quip that's quite funny. It's funny, but the impact is not there. So you wanted the banana, but what you got is a gorilla holding the banana with the entire jungle. So it's funny, but you don't, the actual, the practical problem is that when you want to test something, like, can I have the user's first name? And then you start to need a database connection with Kafka running or whatever. Like, yeah, you just cannot tear it apart. So of course I choose something like that. Give me what I need. I do what I need and I return. So simple. So I choose pure function, right? Of course, why would I choose OOP? If everything is pure function, there's like, Tell me, <laughs> what is the downside? And sure, everybody, and then you can say, ah, oh, sure, sure. my language, I can write pure function also. Sure, sure. But remember, it's, it's about this one. It's not whether what you can do is what else can be done to your code base. All right? Like without foot down, you share. So this is pure functions for your whole code base. Okay. Okay, some, some example code like this. Let me see. Uh, uh, 
Okay, I'm running this guy. Actually, I don't need this one. Let's just look at the code. Wow, this, this. Okay, yeah. So when I said that um, the type is, is different, it's a different ball game, right? This is what I mean. Like, okay, um, in all your methods and your values are come together. You have a user, the, the methods come together. So in, in functional languages, the values are values. They are plain. Values can exist here. You can save them on the list. You take them out. It's still the same, same value. And then the functions that work with the values are also independent. So you can say, uh, I don't know. Display. Play. Yeah. Cannot type away. Is a member, and I can say uh, member plus member name. Fine. Yeah. Right now I'm displaying member. Uh, this is type in third. We can we can type it. But you don't have to. And if you are using it wrong, uh, points. It will tell you, right? On, on the left side, it's, it's really fast. So let me see. Name is happy again. And in Elm, especially with the formatting, once it snaps, it's like Lego. Once it snaps, it's good. And then you'll be like, okay, actually points. Uh, let me see. Maybe we want membership, right? All right. Type. I don't know. Membership. Uh, okay, what kind of membership do you have? You have a active new uh, membership. This is a new member or active member or expired. Expired when? Expired during this time. And then you'll be like, okay, then now you can start to model your people. Or you can say that actually, you know what? They're different kind of members. So now I say that this, this is a this is displaying this guy, right? Oops. Display to string. And you may have a lot of code in your code base that work with members, and then be like, hey, you know what? Our uh, startup has changed. We we gonna let people administer themselves. Uh, so there's gonna be an uh, administrator and a normal member. Okay, okay. They be like, okay. So I have a, a user is an admin with uh, I don't know who the admin is or a regular member. Member. So now you have to like okay. Not I want I can't display member only. I can I can display uh all kinds of all kinds of it, it's either uh, admin or regular member. So the error pops out already, right? Case M of uh, admin. I can't really use M for anything. I do have to break it up that I have properties to use it. This is the M that I, I, we didn't say what it was. Let's pretend that it is uh, a string and say that this is admin. Uh, S. And then you have your regular M. oh no no M again it snaps the compile so so this kind of change right where like you know we, we we need to can you imagine doing this in OOP oh okay I forgot my base class you're screwed like, basically <laughs> so um yeah this, this is what I'm sure for now later I'm, I'll continue with this Okay, it's a little bit like TDD, where you put the types here and then the, the compiler just keeps running and then there's, there's an error here. Oh, actually, you got this wrong, you got that wrong. And it feels nice. I, I put two goalposts and I can now focus my attention on, my, on, the, on the function body. Oh, oh. wow, okay. Yeah, so uh, I love TDD. I gave a talk about TDD, but I love it when I 
don't have to do it. This is even better. So if you, if you think that I don't get it, then go and look at this talk and see whether I get it or not. So in, in Elm, I write much fewer tests. Because if I realized that a chunk of tests in your code is actually about wiring. This thing connect to this thing. It, it's not really about the logic. It's like the, your components come together. And when you have types like the Elm kind of types, you don't have to worry about that anymore. And the, the other kind of test where like, uh, I give you an integer, you're supposed to give me A, B, or A plus, you know? So those, you still have to write tests. So how does it work on the back end? So now we go into how do I use Elm on the back end? Uh, just to, be, to start this. So before I went like all in like Elm with the back end, right? I was doing Elm on the front end and then with the Golang server on the back. And then one day I felt really funny because like, and when you're Elm, you saw how I was coding just now, I was just moving around, code is snapping around and it's all, all good, fine and dandy. And then you'll be developing this feature. Okay, great. I'm going to call this API and then Go is going to give me and it's good. I need alternate tap to the, to the code base and then the Go code comes out. It feels so sad, right? Because huh, you lost the types, it's imperative, it's OB. Uh, so like, okay, why, why not? Why not let me have it? The full spectrum, the full stack in all this goodness. Can it work? How does it work? So this is uh, what you can find on the website, a regular Elm app that is quite similar to React. You start the thing, you have a DOM element somewhere, and then you mount it, and then you start to render within the div. No biggie. But little do you know that this is, this is in the browser package. In the core package, there's this thing called platform worker from the core library. And you know, you notice the difference is that there's no node to mount on. This thing is meant to run headless. Okay, so it's LMAP, but it's headless. So in diagrammatic form, this is what the regular M element looks like. You the app boots up and you're given flags. Whatever flag you choose to give, it can be nothing. The responsibility of the init is to create the state of your application. It can be like counter is zero. That's okay, that's the state. There's, there's two things it does. Create the model and optionally fire off a command, which means maybe I want to boot and fetch some data from API or not. And then whatever thing you do, Elm will do for you because it's pure language. You actually don't do anything. You only tell the runtime, uh, can I go there and do this? It's like, it's like a toddler in a room, right? Go toilet or something if you ask. But you ask every, at Elm, after it fetches, does the dirty work of fetching all the information, it will give it to you. So you are always on like the receiving end, on the callback only. So the model that you create plus the new message, you call the update. And again, you can do two things. You can update the model, or send a new command. And when a new command comes in, you take the most updated model and record the update. So the cycle just goes on and on. And I think Elm will base on the request animation frame and it will call you. Like you, you never call anybody. Elm will call you to, can you, based on the model, give me what you want to render on the website? Very straightforward, very, very small and straightforward. Now on the worker in the headless model, very similar, obviously, no view, everything is the same. So you can imagine a command line app, you boot up, it gives you a flag, you create some state, and then now you can maybe, I don't know, read a file, or I don't know what, da, 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 come back in, and then this cycle just keep continuing. And in this two diagram, the sub, sub is uh, subscription, is things that you don't initiate. Like for example, if you, if over here you said that, I want to make a request to example.com. That you initiated this, the response that come back will come back to you. But if you are not doing anything, some things could still happen. Meaning that if the person might move the mouse, uh, uh, web, most likely WebSocket. So WebSocket message arrive. The sub will come in and you'll come to you. You have the model and the message you decide what to do. So this this uh, very simplistic model, I'm, I'm still, I'm quite surprised that it can cover quite a lot of things. And for the backend, then you will have to store the state somewhere else. So I interact with 
over for myself, I interact over GraphQL to Hashira to talk to my Postgres. So that keeps it hack free and simple. Now remember that uh, this is the code that you initiated the worker. So you have a headless Elm app running. You have already initiated the, the init, the init portion. Now you have model and optionally you have fired off, fired off a command. So what you need to do is that you must know that this pure program doesn't do anything. It sits inside somewhere. You must wrap it with a harness yourself. So we are doing a web application. So you will use the standard library from Node, create a HTTP server, put one request handler. You try to reduce the amount of code in JavaScript because that's where you don't want to live. The whole point is that from this request, you create a value. You don't want uh, just a plain value that is uh, not, nothing special. And with this value, you can now use a port to tell them this thing happened. Like we said over here just now, things that you do not control. A request comes in, it's not, up to, it's not you ask for it. It came in two, three, four, then these will all come in. So this is one subscription that will come in to you. And then uh, now it is in your Elm realm of code already. You can handle it in your update. But if your Elm code like decide, oh, this should be a 404, then what does it do? It will call a port out and say that, and pass it the regular values. And notice that the, this response is actually the same response. So the request that comes in, you are actually, when you do this, you're actually doing a rest.write hit. So yeah, you're replying to the correct response. And with these two things set up as, as, a, uh, as a scaffold to host, host your pure ML app, then you have, you're, you're in business already. Okay. So just a recap of pure functional program. Your program is pure. Runtime gives it stuff and you give it back. That's all. Most of the things is done by, uh, you, you can decide what to do, but to do it, the runtime has to give it to you. So for example, HTTP comes, comes back into you, you request for HTTP request. So now we look into the program, the, the M, M part of the code. So yes, you got the request in and it's in, it's in the data structure. The headers is like that, this is like that, this is like that. What do you do with it? You can say, create a type, maybe call page for your routes, uh, not found new speed. Of course you get like just now, um, remember that when I was creating the admin user, I have some parameters along with it. You can also say like new speed for which user, right? It can be more complicated than this. So is there, then you have a, have a function that just calculate, okay, if the path looks like this, maybe it's gonna be this page. If it looks like that, you're gonna be that page. Not, not rocket science actually. And then you have the concept, you can have the concept of who is this visitor? You look at the HTTP header, maybe there is a JWT, maybe there's a cookie, you decode the header and the decode you have to write yourself. Huh? And then you decide, I think this person's login session is still valid. So you'll be okay. Now you can park this person as a login person and you can now pattern match and use the user.email or user.id. If the decode fail, then you are just anonymous. So with these two values, you can now have a switch case. If I'm a login user on this thing, I'll, have, I'll do this. If I'm a login user on that thing, I'll do that. Otherwise, if it's anonymous, I don't care what page you're on, I'll just bring it to the login page. So now you're, you are in this nice, nice world where, where everything inside is, is, um, is pure functions. And the runtime is this, so everything is set up already. Right, 200, okay. Like, fine, big deal. <laughs> Actually, at this part, it's, it's still like, uh, okay, like you, you have written a web server using bash, big deal, right? So no, no problem. You want something better. There's this thing called Lambda, uh, which what I'm using is actually based on uh, by Mario Rogic. He came to Singapore for a while and then we met a couple of Elm developers, which is literally a couple of Elm developers, right? Uh, so then he, at that time he was quite really, really nice and generous. He shared his ideas and why and how it works. So this is his venture, super cool. Basically this is what you are doing right now. There's a lot of things in the middle, you cry from there. 
SQL to code, code to JSON to front end to JavaScript. And then you have, you have deployment to do also. So for him, it's like, have this. I've got a host for you. And then the front end and back end is going to talk. Still abstract. I'll show you another diagram later. So what it means, remember those diagrams that we were pointing out just now? This one, this diagram. So you basically have two of them. This is the one with the front, with the view, the normal, and this one on the, on the back end. And how these two Elm talks is magic. Eh? And then this is even more magic. I should have made the picture bigger that side. This means that your server side variables is your database. When you have a new user, you basically put it into a list and call it a day. You don't lose your user. So you don't have, there's no idea of connect to database, do a operation, did it succeed? No, it succeeded. You have just added the variable. You've just changed the name. So you're playing with memory and it's all persistent. So this world is very, very good, huh? very nice. But for my startup, I, I'm out of innovation token. So I better pick like something safe like Postgres. So what I do is something like that. Still magic, but I talk to a database here. This magic is largely inspired by Lambda. How does this thing work, right? It's like you pass a message. I'll show you a later, but right now it's something like that. On the client side, so you saw the custom type already. You can either send a hello string or a goodbye. That's okay, so I send a hello string. It magically goes to the encode into JSON or question mark, whatever format. It goes to the server and the server is able to understand it and then you can code it. So both sides are just coding to and fro, which is, Actually a bit OOP. Eh? So actually we are back to using OOP. So to show you what it means. Okay, something like that. Okay. So imagine that uh, this is one file, but imagine this is this is two different files. And that the first part is, is from the client. And then you are saying that the client can send this and that. And in order to, when, when the client send you a value, you, you must be able to handle it. Handle client message from client. And then you, after you handle it, you give back a message from server, right? So what we can say is this case message off. So this is all you have to do to talk to the server and the server handles it. You don't have to find a place, do a post, or do other things. All the connection is done. So it could be hello. This is a string. And then we can say, okay, then I'll return a greet. You too. Maybe. And then you say goodbye. I can say farewell, I think. Right? It snaps. Oh, I forgot to show you this one. It snaps. It snaps. It works. And then on the, when you return the value, the client will get it as well as a HTTP response. And when, when he gets it, they say, okay, okay, you know what? I do have to handle all the possible messages from the server. So message from server to message from client. Message. So the client, well, we can choose how to handle things. Uh, message of... And then now you must say, if you do wrongly, of course, then the compiler is wrong. So there's no point to do that. Great. Uh, whatever the server said. I think it's very funny. Like, if I keep returning that, it infinite loop. So, 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 <laughs> so that actually this one should be a maybe, right? And I can say just, and then when you say goodbye, maybe I don't say anything. Right? right? Then at least, at least something like right? so over here, then I'll be okay. Then maybe this is also a maybe. Huh? I can choose not to reply to you. Right? Otherwise, we keep greeting each other like overly kind, uh, polite people. And then maybe you greet me. I mean, I greeted you, greet me inside. So I don't need to say anything. Oops. And if you say farewell, which didn't happen, uh, I can say just goodbye. It snaps, it works, it's fine, okay? 
So now you can do things like that. Or you can say, uh, it's cheap. Fair one never happens. Uh. So you can say that, okay, uh, ah, this one, funny. If, if, if you say, you, or whatever, bad word, and then I can just say, farewell. Huh? So on, on a special case where you say something, I'll just say, well, otherwise I'll bring you back. So by doing this, so imagine this is too far. This is all what I'm doing. I'm, I've already been playing with two API calls. The client is just sending things to and fro. I don't need to do a lot of things that traditionally you're doing. Maybe you change the GraphQL file, put the GraphQL schema, prepare the HTTP client, da 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 right? So this is the, this is the kind of speed we're talking about. Nah, smells like GraphQL actually. So for me, Elm is this very tiny thing that doesn't have a lot of crap. I mean, it still has some things. That's why people don't like it. And you can find a blog post here. Elm is wrong. But wrong about what, right? So, uh, so but it's super tiny and it tries to not include things that are questionable. And this actually liberate you. You now have a few set of very good tools to apply your engineering creativity to solve problems. Like when I first started to code Elm, then you, the, the funny feeling was that, yeah, I could solve a lot of problems last time with, with all, all the platforms that I'm, I'm on. But I don't always like what I wrote. Like, uh, you know what? This one not a good day. Uh, maybe my algorithm not very nice. Or oh, this, this is a bit messy. So I want ex excuses are like this is this, later I'll, I'll refactor it and make it nicer. So that is generally like I can do everything, but I don't like what I did. In Elm, I, especially when I'm learning, I, I couldn't do anything. <laughs> I don't know how to do anything. But when I learn, ah, oh, actually, you just need to do this like that. And I look at the code, I actually like it. I don't know about you, but like even the like random typing just now, right? Uglier and hackier in any other language. Let me see. Uh, so okay, so we get time. 45 minutes. Let me see if I can do it. Okay. Um so this server is um, running and it is connected by WebSocket and HTTP request. So there's a, there's a WebSocket connection. There's also, when you do something like that, this is a normal, normal request and response. But the thing is, as far as the app is concerned, whether it's WebSocket or HTTP, it doesn't matter. The transport is irrelevant. You are still sending over the same messages. Okay, so we what we have here is we can do something like let me see. Fine. Okay, so there is this thing that I had. Uh, I don't know where I'm going. Oh, uh, view comments. Okay, so you 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 when you type you notice this part. If it breaks, something is wrong. If it succeeded, it, you'll be working already, which is a feeling that you don't get anywhere else. So this is um, like just, a, just a data. And I'm just trying to show you, hopefully trying to show you uh, something about like changes in, in code. Because you, because you cannot design everything upfront. It's very easy for you to uh, reach a situation and then the architect will come and tell you, ah, ha, ha, you didn't, you didn't, you forgot to base class this and do an adapter, right? Then like, uh, so if you try to follow those kind of code, what you have is you have a code base full of premature abstraction, and which then you have to carry along all the way, which may or may not happen. You know, end of, end of the day, you have this adapter of one thing, right? So best case scenario is that you you just you just do. Hmm. So this data comes from here, which is lame. It's, it's hard coded there, fine. So uh, so the view row does this. True, false, if I recall correctly, it controls that, uh, uh, controls that duck, duck line. It's quite annoying. Right? Okay, so first of all, I think we do want this to be data. Uh, 
Okay, so this is uh, comments. All right, moments is this one. Okay, and over here is okay. Oops, ah. Okay, at least I found out, right? Okay, fine. Da, da, da. And then so it, it, it compiles, so it probably works. And I don't want to do this. I, want, I just want a, a list of comments. Fine. Now it's broken because this thing is supposed to be. So no problem. So we will. Um, List map. I'm trying to view the row. Uh, we got true or false. I don't care first. And each of the comments I have. Okay, still works, but the line is like kind of iffy. So you know, the, the line is like whether it's the last one or not. So let's just do something here where like um, view row. What index are we? And what row are we? Viewing row with line. Da, 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 da. So, and then, of course, we need a total first. That uh, is length comments. Uh, view row true or false will depend on its index plus one is total, and then we view the row. Okay, so so far, so good. But I don't want to use this function, I want to use the other one. Map will just map through the thing, but index map will give you the index uh, and the end object. So view row with line. Okay, it works. Da, da, da. And then now, now, not the last row, the last row. True, false. Okay, fine. So this is a small change. And you see that this is like hard coded. I'm viewing, I'm just viewing comments and stuff like that. But then um, requirements change. Okay. Um, it's no longer just comments because we're talking about feed, right? So it, the, the feed needs to have other things. And then what do you do? So I just find, ah, but I didn't know my, my code is about comments. And now you say that the feed has to be have other things. And then think about the platform of your choice, PHP, Ruby, whatever. How do you adapt to this chain? So over here, I can just say that there's a comment item. And then it's comment. Okay, I have just created a uh, like a, a category of things, and then now I can have other things here. But for now, let's just start with only one thing because our code is is like that. So which means that this guy cannot be comments anymore. Right now, it's a list of comments. Hmm? But, uh, but I don't want, I want this to be a list of feed item. Okay. I purposely do this so that the compiler will, will fail so that I can, I can now do what I need to do. So in order to create a feed item, see the con one of the constructor is this one. Remember just now I'll comment. So basically I just have to prefix this guy. So now this is a feed item. You see the red underscore goes away. This is also a feed item, so great. So now I have a feed item, but I see of course it's still compiling, still error. But this is data. I know this part is right. I don't have to care about it anymore. Da, 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 da. Come on here. This guy is not happy because I'm passing like feed items in, right? Okay, okay. So this is it. So over here, this is also wrong. I'm gonna be expecting feed item inside. And I don't have all this already. Or other item. Okay, yeah, thanks. So so what? This is auto pick. I need to break up because this, this part deals with like all the comment stuff. So maybe I should, maybe I should break it up into this. So that, that close, close, close. And then this is view comment. Let's, let's have the old comment here. And then this is a list of HTML start. HTML message, which uh, actually nothing. Like, I'm just trying to copy the, the signature on top. 
few command. Uh, I think it was something like that. This is like restructuring in JavaScript. You have you have this also. So blah blah blah. This one kind of works. And then there's a red line somewhere. So these brackets are gone. Uh, you wait for it to snap. Oh fuck, it works. Okay. Uh, but I must be. I didn't call it. So I know I didn't call it. So of course I put as <laughs> I put as empty one, right? So this is like all the comments. Okay, fine, fine, fine. So this is the children is is a case of what is it? What do they call it? Call it item, right? They call it item. Okay, case of item. Oh, and then we have a command item command. Oops, and then the I think it's a view command. Okay. So far, so good. Now, these children can go inside here. I think. Very low morale. La nothing changed because it works. Uh. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, ah, so now, well, now that it works, the thing is that, okay, what was the change requirement? But now you have refactored already. You have created this thing on top. Called, now you can add new things. Because earlier on, we didn't. In a, in a, in a, let's say in a Java world, like, oh, you forgot to do an adapter. Now, now the work is like really hard. But over here, I just moved things around and kept it going, right? Da, 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 da. So we go. So actually, there are other things like assign item. Assign something. Uh, assignment. Okay. There, there's some details that uh, assignment. And then there's also um, tag item, which you will see what, what all these are later. Lah. Add oh text added. Okay. So now our feed consists of three things. One is comments and then there are assigned items and type items. The compiler is crashing, which is great. So we go back to our page and say, okay, you know what? When we have our assign item, oops, it's not like that. Well, we have data, and then we have we can view assign on. Oh, I forgot what's the name. Uh, of course. I must cheat a bit with the HTML because I'm not gonna write HTML right here. Huh? But at least you can see the what the refactoring uh, process is like. Mm. All right. And then we like tag, tagged, tagged, tagged data. Uh, okay. Okay, so I have split up the three kinds and then give them each of them a view. And so so what do we get? <clears throat> Because we don't have data, that's right. Because we only have comments, uh, no problem, no problem. <laughs> Scare myself. Uh, so assign uh, item, assign item. I forgot the data. So let's copy from here. And you snap, you like, you like it to snap. Uh. So Bob, give to Alice. And like, okay. Nine hour ago, whatever. Something else. So then you can add the tag item. Like oh, I forgot the tag. Uh, let me add this last one. Tag items. We have this guy, right? Uh, page. Tag. Tag item. Uh, then you have this. It snaps. Fine. At least added. I I need to know what's a tag, but later. Three hours ago. Okay, so let's find out what the tag is. Tag, 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 tag. Tag, tag is just color and content. Go back to here. I put a color and content. I think red, something like that. Well, you can go and find the type value. Lah. It's not really cheating. But okay, fine. Uh, we're good. All right. So to refactor things like that, to move things around. Oh, we made a mistake. It's not just comments. It's it's pretty easy. And to me, the magic is this thing that places call some types. If you have a language that has some types, it's really, really nice. Uh, Elm shows the name like custom types, but it's still the same. So this structure, hands down, beat any OOP organi code organization they're going to give me. Um, I think the presentation is roughly finished. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, any questions? Okay. Okay. Okay.
Then can I ask something? Yeah, because just now your front end and back end is in Elm. So, uh, but I think just now you also use JavaScript function right, for the back end. Yes, to wire it together. My JavaScript function is about like that. The, the key of it is you have this uh, wrapper. Oh. And to support WebSocket, your browser also need a bit of JavaScript as a wrapper. To me, these are like infrastructure code. Mm. It, it just, it, there's no, like for example, just now we were doing the API changes, feed, comments, it's nothing to do with JavaScript. Oh. Yeah. So you do need this to host it, which is the a pure functional program works like that. So you're only writing this, you do have to provide a little bit of runtime. Yes, some JavaScript. As in, like, can you like talk between Elm and JavaScript? And also, right, because like, let's say like finding Elm developers nowadays, I don't think it's that easy. And finding JavaScript developer is much easier. So like, yeah. But, what, but the question is, what do you want to find them for? Uh, like, let's say you hire in the startup, then you want to find developers. But you want to find, like, for example, that site, what? there's a lot of JavaScript developers. Yeah. You hire them. What, what do you want? Yeah, them to do, do like yeah. Server. Let's say like the server is in JavaScript only and like the front end is in L. Like this is possible. Well, why would you want to write your server in JavaScript? I, I told you the experience of Go and Elm, right? Yeah. I was like very happy doing all this just now, like and then alternate to my Go, like ah, I, I go for lunch. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so so why would you like if you had this uh option, mm -hmm. why would you like, huh? If my code base is Elm, it's really nice, but I see a lot of JavaScript developer there. Let's get them over here to stir some mess. You know, like, why? Uh, let's say like cost effectiveness. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so you're choosing this, uh, uh, right? I'm choosing something. I'm, I, I choose more people to come and do this with me. Yeah. <laughs> I, choose, I choose this one. Right, I choose this one because one, there's just more of those people. Yeah. Hey, can you all come and do this for me? <laughs> but true, uh, hiring Elm developer is a bit harder. Yeah. But at least when you hire, then now we are writing in Elm, you see? Mm. Like if I get one, it's like it's positive one. If I get one, I don't know whether it's a positive or negative, you know? Mm. So that's that's my that's my opinion, uh, my personal opinion. I see. Okay. <laughs> I think there's a question in the chat. Are there any performance advantages or concerns with Elm? Since Elm is purely functional, I was wondering how the mem memory management is. Uh, I have not had a problem. My server runs on Lambda, which is like, like 128 megabytes. It's fine. It's better, than, but definitely better than my last rail server, which has two gigs and it's like swapping. Uh. Yeah, so, uh, so to also augment just now the question, um, th there, are Java there are JavaScript. In fact, in the, in the company code base, you have a lot of things. You have definitely some YAML files for whatever purposes. You have some shell script, you have some JavaScript. So to me, these things are bucket together. They, they, you need these things to, to get it working. But you don't hire people for these YAML JavaScript files. Yeah. So my current uh, startup, my, my code base is 80% 80 80 Elm. And then a huge chunk is uh, actually SQL. Oh. Because you, you might as well write some trigger code in the Postgres to do some of this work. And then there's JavaScript just a very little bit. The JavaScript code don't change a lot. Mm. Mm. You like the infrastructure code will be, will be re relatively stable. Uh, yeah. So this is the shell you need. Yeah, I think that's also cool. I'm just curious, like, um, just, you were talking about like using Elm as the front end initially, Golang as the back end. Yeah. So what was it that made you switch to Elm? Like, oh, e the even in, in the first place. Uh, like I said, so in the introduction, you, you hear that I have this side project doing stuff and earning money for my milk powder and all these things, right? So that's my playground to, to deal with things. And uh, professionally, you will not admit it, but sometimes you, you are maintaining your old code and something goes wrong and you look at it, you'll be like, well, I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm writing. And it struck me really hard that maintenance is hard. And this, this project is running for eight years, 10 years, that kind. So, so you go back like, wow, <laughs> if, if, if I recall correctly, Rails 2, right? <laughs> what are you going to find to fix your Rails 2 bug? And to get into, to understand what's going on, to make a feature is hard. 
Like if I show you just now, so like, oh, there's this command. I want to add a free item. The compiler just break. Uh, it break everywhere. Usually you'll be like, oh, so bad. But it's good. Because you know everywhere to fix. And the fix is very easy. Uh. Each fix, each fix is very easy. Oh, this broke uh, because I like that. The command is here. Okay, now this is done. All, 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 all done. If the same thing happens to your Rails code base, right? What are you gonna do? <laughs> you have you have a lot of tests to rely on. Uh, like you have no tools. It is all your superhuman strength to refactor this and like wow, you have, you have done it. Go for you, uh, but I demand more from the tool. So so I felt the maintainability problem uh, quite starkly. And to be honest, I was actually looking for Elixir. <laughs> Then look at this video, which they're talking about Elixir and using some Elm. And it is the Elm, <laughs> the Elm part that caught my attention. Like this thing looks interesting. The type, just not the direction. The type was surprisingly simple. Like, is that all there is to it? I, I was not used to it, right? You have a class, you have a type class, and no type class. You have a class, you have inheritance, you have polymorphism. But what free item comment? What, what is this about? Is this all that it, could it be, right? Uh, so that that was interesting to me, and then like, and I went to dig out more, And then, oh wow, if I look at this, and I look at the time, I think it was like season seven of React, right? You maybe like class or create class, and after that, maybe three weeks later, it became hoax or suspense or I don't know. Between this, like, it feels more timeless the the way that you build things here versus that, where it's there's a lot of churn in the knowledge that you. You, you build out all this knowledge to use this, and now it's out of fashion already. Yeah. So it's generally a more peaceful tool <laughs> to run an Elm. The, because it doesn't have a lot of tooling, anything you need to do, like, like for example, it'll be like, I need to show a date, and the user needs to change. It's very easy. You need to show something, you better have a state for it. You have a variable for it, you pass a variable down, and you show it. You don't have to. Should I hook it? Should I react context it? Should I pass it through the argument? Is it a prop? There's a lot of questions. Uh, and now it's very simple. You can apply your creativity elsewhere. Okay, another question, but were there any challenges in refactoring from back end? The backend from Golang to down? Oh, that was never done because I don't think <laughs> uh, that, that was never done. That the project is a different project, but uh, it definitely cemented to me that I'm not going to do that again. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the project had, the thing about the project was it has, uh, it has a lot of things. Some of it had, had IoT components to it. It runs on small devices. And some of it is very uh, very transport oriented. I'm, I'm doing gRPC, passing things, and like dealing with 50 connections. Fine, go ahead. But uh, one part of it is this API for the web front end. And, and that changes, like, oh, you have user, you have admin, maybe they should. So, so those changes, uh, I think, it is not Golang's forte to, to do it. It's not particularly strong in doing it. I mean, you can do an API server in, for that purpose, but to change um, the requirement and concepts is kind of tedious. Uh. Okay, one last question is, so given the simplicity of L, would you say it's a good tool to use in like hackathons? If, first of all, you must, no way first. Uh. Don't go to a hackathon and learn Elm. <laughs> so after, after you know Elm, then you know where the boundaries are. Like just now I was describing the Golang project. I'm not going to reuse Elm to run an IoT device or the whole gRPC connection for other people. Right? So, so that's, not, that's not where it goes. So um, since Elm has a very, very small, in fact, it has like zero support for backend. It is written for the front end. But the language itself, you can look at it and see that this is obviously more or less general purpose. Just that the, the support is not there. What's the support is not there for the back end. You have to be rather selective. Like, what is your hackathon about? Like, I have HTTP, GraphQL, Postgres. If that's not your thing, I really need this Postgres connection to do SQL, then maybe Elm is not for you. So, so that's that was actually what I did. So I like this language and I want to know where are its boundaries so that in my next project, I can use it. I, do, I don't want to like, wow, this is so interesting. And then a project comes along. Oh, wow, I'm so excited to use it. I don't, I don't know where the edges are. And I have a bad experience using it. Right. So I dove in and like, okay, this is where I think the language is good with. 
in that case, in a hackathon, yeah, I will choose Elm. But people will say, pick the best tool for the job. But usually it's like, pick the most familiar tool for the job. Ah. So might as well you <laughs> pick the most familiar tool for the job. You might as well learn some different things and then like actually apply it when, when the situation arises. So thank you, Chunke, for the very insightful speech about Elm. It makes me want to learn more about Elm, actually. Oh, please, please go. And, <laughs> and see you guys next week, Um, even though uh, next week is a fully online Friday hacks. <laughs>